But don't forget that brewing is a, like science is a religion. It's a form of religion. And it has its dogma and its myths and its superstitions. It has more control over us than we have of the yeast. The way the beer is made is really designed around the yeast. So the yeast is the star of the show. That's a great comment, Dan. <laughs> I, I've never looked at it that way, but I think you're you're very you're very right. And I guess the origins of brewing probably were even more so that way. So that I think that takes us to you, Matthias, with with yeast, because isn't that kind of how it got started? That that they had a, a a brush or a broom that they would stir with, and they just knew that it would make beer if they stirred it with that. But they really didn't know what was in it. Yeah, that's a very interesting uh, aspect. Um, the the thing is that in the past, uh, people uh, that um, made beer, they were very intelligent. They exactly knew what they do or what, what they did. And uh, <clears throat> they, this was just try and error, error and a lot of observation, but observation over hundreds of years and from father to son and uh, it's always um, let's say a little bit uh, let's say we make it too easy to say okay this were like prim primitive cultures no they had a lot of time and they tried a lot and they produced a lot of perfect indigenous fermented beverages all around the world because we humans we try to make something better. And that's exactly what happened to beer in different uh, parts of the world. And uh, yeah, yeast is just um, one thing. Uh, and uh, let's say grain and hops, that's other things. But they observed that yeah, there was foam, there was sediment. They did not know that it was a microbe, but they know they knew exactly that it was active. And when you add it to another, uh, let's say, juice or word, that the uh, fermentation starts again. And uh, that's what I like in my research so much. And that's why we go to other, let's say, uh, places and uh, very historic cultures to check how did they brew. And every, let's say, way of brewing has its special way of thinking like Dan mentioned there's it's kind of connected to religion to culture and often they found ways um, how to do it and also integrated it into their culture or in their religion and that's what we are so fascinating and when we go anywhere uh, we always learn something new like Dan you know exactly when you go to another brewery uh, they all have completely different technology. Every beer is different. Every process is different. Fermentation vessels are different. The organisms are different. People who make it are different. So, And that's so fascinating about brewing now and in the past. Uh, it's interesting that uh, if you look at a brew breweries that are not, not new breweries, but a brew older breweries, breweries that are well over 100 years old, if you visit the brewery, You'll, you'll, you'll notice that the way the beer is made is really designed around the yeast. So the yeast is the star of the show. So every type of beer, whether it's in England or Germany or, or, or whatever, it, it, the, the process of brewing is slightly different. And it's, it's, it's built to suit the use of the yeast because we're very much a symbiotic relationship. We, we need each other. And I don't know, Matthias can speak better about it than I can, but, but I don't think that a lot of these yeasts would survive in the wild without us. And certainly I would not survive without them. So, uh, and, and secondly, what Matthias said is, is really interesting to me because I read a book about a barley breeder and he said that, uh, and you could probably cut this out if you want, Doug, but that breeding, human breeding success is not tired, not tied to intelligence. So that there's no reason for us to think that five or 10,000 years ago, our forebears were not more clever. And actually, they may have been more intelligent than us because all of these things we have, whether they're yeast or, or, or wheat or barley or, or cows or cats and dogs, these were all selected by our forebears thousands and thousands of years ago. They didn't have laboratories 
and geneticists and microscopes and uh, uh, expensive equipment. They just did it, like Matias said, by observation. And they were very, very clever. Uh, and when, when we look back on it, it's actually shocking that they were able to accomplish these things so well with simple observation so they were very they were very very intelligent Tias, so how did you with with that interest and i understand you, you know with your your leadership role there at the university uh what what drew you to georgia what what is there that uh, that really yeah. surprised me like, um maybe you remember we uh, uh have already had contact before when i did uh, one presentation about the history of lager brewing And uh, the history of lager yes. brewing is very special. Why? Uh, because this yeast can stand uh, cold temperature. It's cryotolerant. And uh, that's so special that you can make with this special kind of yeast, this very neutral and very good drinkable beer that is also very good for the human digestion and for the human body. Why? Because this yeast cannot grow at 37 degrees Celsius at our body temperature. And it's easier to digest in comparison to other top fermented beers, for example, like wheat beer or Belgian beers or some ale styles, because the ale yeast or wheat beer yeast, they grow at our body temperature. And that was one of our main questions. Where does this lager yeast come from? And there are a lot of um, scientific work groups that uh, try to answer this question. And one ancestor of this lager brewing yeast, Saccharomyces jubayanus, uh, is the cryotolerant parent of this uh, special lager yeast. And it's a mixture between this Saccharomyces jubayanus and a wheat beer yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And this cryotolerant uh, ancestor we have never found in Europe. And that was our main question. Where is this ancestor coming from? It was found in Patagonia. It was found in Tibet, so close to China uh, or in, in, on the Chinese te territory. Um, it was found in New Zealand, but only single isolates and in North America. But it disappeared in Europe. And now... Um, Geneticists, they saw that the Tibetan strains from the Himalaya region, they are the closest relatives to the lager yeast um, fraction of this cryotolerant parent. And uh, there is this Silk Road theory that means, did this ancestor maybe come from um, uh, Asia? through this Eurasian um, uh, connection via the Silk Road to Europe and make there um, yeah, a couple with the wheat beer strain and made there this perfect match, uh, the, the lager brewing yeast. And Georgia is exactly here on the Silk Road, situated on the Silk Road. And Georgia has another um, very interesting aspect. It's the Uh, motherland of wine. They do this special fermentation with the quaveries, a very old technology where you do like a must fermentation in very special <clears throat> like clay containers that uh, look like amphors and they still have a very unique nature. So uh, most of their uh, forests are st still primal and exactly those regions where we went to, uh, they were very uh, original. In Europe, when you check forests, everything was cut down after the Second World War because everybody needed wood for cooking or just to heat. So we do not have much uh, primary forest left and pri primary plant material. So that could be another thing. Maybe there was this uh, cryotolerant ancestor in Germany or Czech Republic, let's say the motherland of the lager brewing, but maybe we lost this ancestor and that's why we went there. And there's a second aspect, they have a very old brewing traditions, tradition in Georgia. So the breweries we visited are also 400 years old 
and we hope maybe there was a simultaneous evolution of brewing because in this Caucasus region there was also uh, brewing at very cold temperatures similar to Franconia and Upper Palatine, let's say northern Bavaria in southern Germany was from temperature maybe at that time a very similar uh, let's say uh, surrounding and environment and that's why we came with that's why we had the idea to go there so there were different aspects the biodiversity is also a big topic because the biodiversity is completely different when you when you compare it now to western europe the story that yeast Yacht lager yeast had somewhat self-selected because they were brewed in caves where it was cold and centuries after centuries they must have just developed. You don't buy that story. Um, so we have like genetic proof that there was a hybridization event around 1600. And um, we know that before 1883, before Emil Christian Hansen and at the same time, or, or, or let's say almost same time period, Lindner developed the pure culture technique. Well, after that event, we could work with monofermentations. We know that these were all mixed fermentations. Uh, and we know also from documentation that in the, cave, uh, in the cellars, in these caves, in rock caves in Franconia, and Upper Palatine, this technology uh, was developed and arose because they were able to produce non-sour beer uh, with a, a low, temp uh, low temperature fermentation and the elongation of the fermentation time. Um, and this was like the clue. So the, the fermentation took very long and was very low. And for that reason, lactic acid bacteria could not grow in those beer. And uh, when fermentation is still going on very slowly and yeasts are very active, lactic acid bacteria have a very hard time and cannot grow and propagate well. And that's what they recognized. Oh, those beer in those caves, they are uh, not sour and they taste the same for a quite long time and they are very stable. And on the other hand, with the lager technology, they had a sedimentation and took a lot of, out a lot of proteins and the mouthfeel was very good. So that was like two technology in one technology, the cold fermentation and this lagering process. They had no filters, but with the lagering, the mouthfeel and the taste was really good. And then there was the purity law and in Bavaria, you were only allowed to brew with these mixed cultures. They were called Stellhaven throughout Bavaria, only with this technology. And there were a few dukes, or let's say special aristocrats that had special rights to produce wheat beer uh, at higher temperature. Um, and this was also in some cases a little bit stronger, like a festival beer. Uh, in some places, but they were very seldom. And then uh, in the Hofbräuhaus in Munich, this was the only place they got one of the special rights, this duke, because another duke lost this, uh, this right. And they brewed around 1600 in very high quantities for that time, wheat beer and uh, bottom fermenting beer, this brown, strong, stronger beer at the same time for about one decade for 10 years and that's what we could record from all, all our historic research together with Martin Zanko and Franz Meusdorfer. This took a lot of time to find this information and Kevin Verstrepen and Brigida Galone, Belgian colleagues that are very much in genetics, they found um, with genetic studies that uh, hybridization, you can calculate this with mutation, must have taken place exactly in this period of time. So we can reconstruct the genetics and historic data, everything focus to Munich 
at around 1600. And there we also could prove that two special yeasts came from uh, top fermenting brewing sites. So to the Hofbräuhaus, there was one brewmaster from Einbeck from the north. They were very famous for a strong beer and one brewmaster from Schwarzach, a famous wheat beer brewery. And they took both their yeast in this decade. And we think this yeast, this special stronger yeast, were responsible for the higher fermentation degrees and let's say the bottom fermented mixture that was still there and they must have mixed there. We think like you have yeast mixtures, maybe a harvest yeast in a corner, suffering, building ascospores. And if you are lucky between two different species, if they belong to the same genus, they can form fertile ascospores and make a hybrid. Uh, Similar to like Neanderthalian Homo sapiens, if you are lucky, you form a living hybrid. And if you are very lucky, it's still fertile. But our lager yeasts are unfortunately, they form ascospores, but they are not fertile anymore. So they only reproduce as clones. And that's the whole story. And we reconstructed this. And um, yeah, that was the beginning of the lager brewing. Then um, <coughs> Sedelmeier, who worked at the Hofbräuhaus later, found, uh, was founder of the Spaten Brewery, he was a very good friend of uh, Emil Christian Hansen in Karlsberg, Copenhagen, and he did uh, uh, this isolation of the first lager yeast and then made the Karlsberg beer with Jakobsen, and they also gave the yeast back to Spaten, and then this pure culture technique spread all around the world. And that's what is all the, the historic story in Germany, and we thought maybe these mixtures were all also there in uh, Georgia, maybe still they work with mixed cultures, or maybe they're, uh, like when you think about science, sometimes the same thing happens twice in different places of the world. But that's what we did not know. So we went there and just took a lot of samples and now the identifications are uh, running at the moment. And uh, let's see what we will find. So have you analyzed any of the samples yet? Yeah, I can we found uh, up to now, we found Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, top fermenting yeast. We found uh, Saccharomyces urii, a very seldom yeast. Uh, we found Bretanomyces yeast. We found Saccharomyces paradoxus, which often is related to oaks, where we think maybe old Celtic Germanic beers were made with this yeast. But unfortunately, we have not found Jubayanus, this original wild strain, yet. But there's still uh, one batch of um, wild isolates to be identified, but that's the result so far. In one quass-like beverage, it's like a, a rye uh, grain uh, uh, beverage, um, we found uh, Yuvarum. This is very close to the Yubayanos, but the exact ancestor of the lager strain we haven't found yet. So that's a little, little bit disappointing, but we found let's say some other seldom yeast and uh, we found brewing yeast, cerevisia yeast. We have not analyzed yet genetically if they are more related to English ale yeast or German wheat beer yeast or maybe more to wine yeast. So there's a lot of still going on now in the background. So Matthias, is this purely research in trying to get the story or is there actually some direct application that Dan can't wait to get some of this yeast and brew up something delicious yes, with it. Definitely, uh, because we are a brewing institute, we are not just, uh, let's say, pure uh, fundamental research institute. We always have a practical background in our mind. Uh, and uh, we have already made a lot of fantastic beers also with this wild Saccharomyces strain. We made perfect wheat beer with a little bit of orange taste with Saccharomyces paradoxus. 
We had uh, beers, uh, also wheat beer, like the Saccharomyces uri, and let's say these indigenous uh, strains from these mountain breweries. We have not tasted tested yet in our uh, normal brewer's world. So that will be um, uh, very interesting how the beers will taste if they are more like ale yeast or maybe like wine-like or very fruity. We don't know yet. So. We have a, a pipeline when we have new yeast candidates that we first do a pre-tasting in very small scale and do a beer analysis. And then we have an idea, is it good in terms of aroma and taste? And then if this uh, first results are good, then we go to big, bigger scale, 20 liter, 60 liter. And when we recognize a yeast has very high potential, then that would be the point to ask then a, uh, maybe it can we think about a special beer with this yeast. Is it worth to create, let's say, a historic beer or special fruity beer or special uh, wheat beer type beer? Yeah. But it's definitely uh, the, the goal uh, and the task. And that's also why um, Dan is on board and he supported this uh, this study. So thank you very much, Dan. And he um, um, supported also one of our researchers from Argentina, he who is specialist in those wild yeast. So that was a great help. And we, we hope that we can then share also with our Georgian colleagues. So in, in um, terms of microbiology, you always need a partner. Of in this country, according to this Nagoya protocol. So we in Germany need this cooperation and then they have to uh, give the go. But uh, there is no problem if this partner uh, university from Georgia agrees and we find a nice study uh, and uh, characterize a yeast, then we can go to practical brew brewing. So Dan, what, what uh, excites you about this? Is there some potential you see for practical uh, commercial brewing? Uh, certainly, yes. I, on one hand, uh, probably firstly, um, uh, uh, Vine Stefan and Matthias are, are partners of ours and they, they help us. So uh, because we're a team and we're partners, uh, uh, my support it was, uh, uh, was given out of a, a feeling of, of kinship. Um, and secondly, uh, you never know where scientific studies will lead. So so it, it may or may not result in a, in a great yeast, but what it will certainly do is move the ball forward in our understanding. I, I firmly believe that for us as brewers to move forward, we really need to understand where we came from. And the history of lager yeast and brewing in particular is fascinating to me, how through happenstance and um, uh, uh, world events and, and climate change and things that have happened uh, over the centuries uh, have affected how... Um, uh, how we where we are today. So it's important to understand where we were to know where we're going. And uh, but more directly to answer your question, as a craft brewer, all craft brewers spend a lot of time spending deep dive into their raw materials. We we look very closely at our hops, and we look at our malt. We how what our water chemistry is, and yeast has pretty much been the last thing that people have really started to think long and hard about. Before craft brewing, of course, beer was more of an industrial, uh, uh, things have contracted to the point where there was a very small amount of brewers, at least in America, producing a large amount of beer, and they were somewhat homogenous, and the, and the procedures of brewing were pretty much well understood and documented, and everybody brewed in a certain way, and it was nothing wrong with that way, it produced a, a, a flavor that was popular, people drank millions of barrels of it, and they were very successful, but it maybe was a little bit boring. Yeast is probably the most important ingredient in beer. It has the greatest impact on beer. If you ever tasted the base of work, base of beer, the wort, it's more like an extract of cereal, like breakfast cereal. And beer has a very a desirable flavor, and that's solely due to yeast. So uh, then, it, what you look at two schools of thought currently. There are our laboratories that are investing in. Um, shall I say, genetic modification of yeast to try to produce certain characteristics that brewers desire in yeast. And as people become more comfortable with that technology, 
uh, they're baby stepping forward. And, and so there's a lot this, of work this is the CRISPRs you hear about. Up. Yes, 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 yes. But what Matthias is talking about is going backwards in time. And Matthias um, uh, kind of talked about the, the pinch points, which was Carlsberg with pure yeast, that it's possible uh, uh, Matthias and other research, researchers have, have, have told us that that pinch point, we may have lost a lot of genetic diversity. We may have lost in our rush towards uniformity and consistency. We have lost some some aspects. And so he's he's a yeast hunter uh, looking for some of the things from the past. So if we find something, that would be, to me, icing on the cake. And I have my fingers crossed, and uh, I know that eventually something will come out of this. Um, so it's, it's yep, yep. there's many reasons why this Dan, is Dan, one of the surprises I had recently, I was at Sierra Nevada with their brewer, and we were walking around, and I said, I want to go to your yeast lab. Uh, which is not very dangerous because I don't know what anything about them. But uh, we started talking about the beers, and I said, okay, so so what do you put in your pale ale, uh, house yeast? What, what, what do you put in your stout, house yeast? Uh, what, what do you put in Bigfoot, house <laughs> yeast? <laughs> is that all you guys use? He said, well, we do a Hepaweizen. We've, we've got a Hepi that we use for that and if we do a lager we've got a lager yeast he didn't didn't say which ones for either one but the majority of sierra nevada's beers are brewed with a house mm-hmm. yeast so i was a little surprised at that so what, what do you think matthias your research and dan the practical side of it from a brewing what what do you think that might enable in in future craft yep. breweries um the thing you highlight, um, that's very interesting because yeast, uh, as Dan mentioned, gives the, let's say, most of the aroma change when you think about wort and beer. And yeasts are very diverse in terms of aroma and also biotransformation, so precursors from, let's say, the hop malt matrix. Every yeast is like a different machine when you think about machines or uh, companies, yeah, and then you have your raw material and you have another product in the end. But what is very difficult is when you have different yeast strains, you need different yeast pipelines in the brewery, different vessels, and you have to separate them. When you think about the technology of Hansen, the pure yeast, so this is the most difficult screw to drive or to change uh, because Adding hops or malt in the brewers is much easier than make a new fermentation with another yeast sign and set, set up a, a new process. So that's often the reason why brewers do not change the yeast strains so often or have five or ten yeast strains in a brewery. Some do, like Dan is like a pioneer and that's um, what I appreciate very much that you use different yeast strains to produce different kinds of beers and you have very subtle changes you want to to add to the beer and that's really let's say the next advanced step in brewing use the yeast diversity more and also then the the next step would be go back before Hansen and make mixed cultures again but mixed cultures with our knowledge knowledge now to add two or three strains that fit very good together or maybe make one basic strain that is very robust and add two aroma strains, something like this. And the, the Berlin guys before yeast, the pure yeast culture was invented, they said uh, the beer from Emil Christian Hansen, it doesn't taste very good, it tastes like water, it's not beer anymore because they lost all these house microbes. And I think that's a very good point also to in mm. when you think about also disinfection and cleaning and uh, like hot caustic, we put a lot of energy and chemicals to make everything pure and hygienically pure. Maybe that can be the, the next step to have a very robust microbiology and do the fermentations there. And then you do not have to uh, let's say disinfect everything again. When also when you think about the idea of a robust intestine and how a robust uh, microbiota in, uh, in in a body similar to that, when you think about the brewery like a living 
organism. So that's what we also think a, a lot about in research. Now, I just want to mention one point because uh, that uh, the, the idea Dan had, we um, uh, observed in uh, Georgia that uh, in this brewing culture that is also now disappearing, uh, we found a very nice story that there was uh, in a small village, like the brewmaster, the chief of the village, and a, a helper that was elected. And then they had to go to nature, to a special place. This was a holy pray place before Christianity, but now the Christianity adapted the same place. And this was like a mountain forest with very special plants. And these two guys had to go there and not have contact with women, no sex, and not eating meat for four months. And they had to survive with fruits and only plant material there for four months. And then they could go back to their brew house and start the beer. And that was every year the same procedure. First a cleaning and like a bath in nature where you can like imagine that they took were covered with the microbes there and then they started the brewing and the fermentation and this was like an eye opener every culture like developed their own start of brewing and they maybe recognize there are plants like holy plants maybe that are um, the reason why the the beer tastes like it tastes uh, and that's all also about conservation. If we lose this knowledge of this old culture, it will be lost forever. That's also one reason why we do that. And if we can collect yeast, for example, we also found uh, Brettanomyces, maybe a new Brettanomyces there. We also maybe can recreate those old beer styles or make completely new beer styles. But if the microbes are lost, and if this culture is lost, it will be lost forever. And that's why I appreciate so much also to work with so innovative brewers like them that have an open mind for such stories in this background, cultural and historic background. So are you saying they didn't have a something to stir with, that it turns out that what was on the stirring stick was actually yeast and that was mm -hmm. making the beer ferment? You said these guys would have to go to this special place for four months, only consume fruits and vegetables that they got out of that forest. Then what, what did they do when they went in the brew house? Did they stick their finger in it or? Yeah. The, um, what? <laughs> what so kicked it there off? were like two different kinds of procedures. For sure, they also had like dried yeast that was uh, dried on a wooden plate over winter. But this was then a special technology, but they also had the start of the brewing where there was no inoculation. And the stick they steered was also in the, uh, in the hot word. So uh, the inoculation came from them or from the surrounding. Often it's not like this air, but it's the microbes stick more to small particles that are in the air on small uh, particles of your body um, um, and yeah that's probably is very similar to the same uh, story of the Belgian lambic brewers only the environment is different and maybe they made different observation depending on your special niche where you are living and probably in America in some farmhouse ales I also heard of a brewery that do not have Cerevisiae, Saccharomyces cerevisiae in their beer, but only Brettanomyces. Also depends on this environment, this special niche. But there was then, for sure, always a beginning from nature, wood or other fruits, or maybe also vectors, like we call them, like human or birds or insects or so. Dan, when we first started, you were saying how, how much a, a brewery can many times just be built around the yeast and they don't change it. We're nearly the same way from a s mythical religious point of view that we, <laughs> we, we don't completely understand what will happen to that uh, machine, yeast machine, Matthias, as you describe it. So we just don't change it. Mm -hmm. It's working. 
That's correct. Well, on, on one hand, you're 100% correct. Uh, we as humans, uh, if we're successful at, 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 at something uh, and, and we don't want to jinx ourselves, we, we continue to do whatever it is that, that we do. It's a combination of both. I think uh, generally humans appreciate that combination. So having a little bit of sourness in, in our wine, for example, is important. Yeah. And in our beer, but not too much. Even beer has some nice background sourness, but we don't want too much. So as brewers, we're always fighting that because because yeast, Saccharomyces, and, and Lactobacillus, a, a, a bacteria that produce these acids, they, they like to be together. They, they're, they're good friends, and they like to work together. I read a paper written, I think, over 100 years ago where uh, the, an English writer was comparing the economics of the British way of brewing in those days was is to be very, very highly hopped. So they spent a lot of money on hops. Hops are bacteriostatic, and they had warm weather, and that's how they overcame this competition with lactobacillus because the hops would really stymie the, the, or hold back the, the souring end of the fermentation, so high hopping rate. In, in, in continental Europe, they had ice, and they used ice to do that by, by not stopping the lactobacillus with the bacteriostatic compound, but by keeping the beer cold. You have um, two very important aspects in terms of shelf life. Um, the one is when you have a mixture of microbes, uh, like lactic acid bacteria plus Saccharomyces cerevisiae plus Brettanomyces, you have a very diverse aroma profile. And this aroma profile covers a lot. So if you have then in, uh, let's say, like champagne bottles, uh, and there you have definitely some oxygen transfer from the top, this aroma, as you mentioned. Yeah, we try to control it, but it's a living organism. Maybe machine is not completely the right word. It's more like a pet. It's more like a, a, um, like a friend you have to treat well. Uh, when I think more about it, uh, no, not machine. It's our small friend, maybe when you think about, maybe it's um, in terms of quantity, the organism most spread in the world. When you think all the breweries and in <laughs> individual, the yeast also made us to propagate it. And uh, maybe the yeast has more control over us than we have uh, on, uh, on the yeast. I don't know. We, it makes us to make alcoholic and good tasting beverages. So maybe we are the, the workers, the slaves of the yeast. There's actually a book, the, the Botany of Desire, that talks about that. When you talk about the various plants that we are, we, are uh, um, we work with in our life, who's really in charge? Is you know, are, are, are mm -hmm. the apple trees and the marijuana plants are they are they in charge or are we in charge? Uh, and this idea that Matthias has to find old yeast strains. It's, it's, it's happening in all aspects of food. When you talk to, to the to very, very old people, you, you read about uh, how raspberries used to taste or how tomatoes used to taste. Or if you travel in Italy and you, and you taste a tomato versus a, a grocery store tomato, we, we have sacrificed a lot to, uh, to, to, to have inexpensive food, which the Green Revolution allowed us now to go to 8 billion mm -hmm. people. And without that, without that green revolution, it would be impossible. We would have had famine and death and war. So on one hand, uh, it's been a very, very positive thing. But on the negative, we've lost a lot. Our food is, is inexpensive, so people can afford it. It's easy to transport, but the flavor has been lost. So raspberries and peaches don't taste like they did 100 years ago. We lost a lot of the flavor components that probably were more true of beer prior to that. And you're saying our foods are maybe a bit the same way, that the the refinement of the apples, the refinement of tomatoes, various things, that we, while we have been able to improve the, uh, the, the, the production, production, the growing characteristics of these fruits, we may have lost some deliciousness as a result. So it's almost like craft farming, uh, an equivalent of craft farming to craft brewing. Well, you know, if you, th I, I, I'm old enough to have started brewing when the old timers were still teaching in school. So, so many of my professors when I was young 
started brewing, were apprenticed before Prohibition. And I, I said to, to one of them, I said, Walter, tell me in your day when you were 16 and working in the breweries, uh, I always heard that the, that there were two or three breweries in every town in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, like, like there are in, in Franconia and Germany, breweries everywhere. I said, was the beer really as good as people remember? He said, no, not really. The beer wasn't very good. It, it was sour. It was inconsistent. And, and really, in the defense of industrial brewing, the reason why these breweries got so big is because they were superior business people. They invested in technology and research and equipment. And I hate to say it, they made a superior beer. Now, over the years, they got, they got more... Uh, uh, can more, more, more say, say popular taste, more common, lowest common denominator, uh, more dumbed down, uh, more price pressure, so less hopping. People uh, uh, maybe with in our uh, our generation drank Coca Cola and Pepsi, so sweet taste, less bitterness. So the beer became less I impactful. So again, it's a duality uh, of of consistency, dependability. The beer always tastes the same. The beer is, is good, but it's not great. And um, the idea is, is for brewers such as myself, our competitive advantage is not in a good price. It's not in being large. It's not having clever advertising. It's having a little bit better taste. And, you know, some of the, re there's, there's, in Munich, there's a really, really well-regarded lager beer, uh, a Helles. And, and in this brewery, they use more than one lager yeast. And it's really not commonly done anymore, but it used to be, Brewers in lager breweries in Germany, they might use two or more more different yeast strains in different tanks and then blend the beer to to the lager tank, thus making it really more harmonious and complex beer. That's gone by the wayside because tanks are bigger, cost pressure. Uh, it was easier to use a single strain of yeast. So that's also an opportunity, as Matthias said, to use multiple yeast strains as long as they play well together. Sometimes yeast don't like to be together. But sometimes they do, and uh, so it's, there's a, it's lots of well, exciting. Well, you've both been very generous with your time. So we started out talking about you could modify, you could add different hops, you could get different grains. But there's a tendency for brewers, breweries, to kind of refine their yeast and only maybe even use one. So at New Glarus, how many yeast do you have there that you regularly use? And how has your relationship with Matthias and his organization helped you be a better brewer? Well, uh, we we have a, a, a yeast uh, bank. We have a um, we have a uh, a refrigerator, more or less, at minus uh, uh, minus eighty degrees uh, Celsius. That we maintain many yeast strains. We probably have I don't know many dozens of yeast. And in a given year, we might produce um, we might use five or six different yeast strains. And one of the reasons why brewers don't do that is because it's it's if you use one to, to understand your yeast strain, like, like Matthias said, it's like a friend. And, and to really have a relationship with that that yeast, you need to spend really a lifetime of work to really drill down to understand the idiosyncrasies because sometimes they misbehave. And if you understand your friend, you understand when they're in a bad mood and you understand how to react. And yeast sometimes do that. So to use... More than one strain is a vulnerability, but our philosophy as a company was to avoid the house geschmack, the house taste, to always have different flavors. For example, you wouldn't want to make a, a, a Bavarian style vice beer with a lager yeast. So you need to have lots of different yeasts uh, available if you want to have different flavors. And so how by Stefan and Matthias help us is, for example, we make more than one hippie vice style yeast. And there are many, many yeast strains, maybe, I don't know, six or eight common ones. And then there are many, many, many more from that. So uh, so, so my wife, my business partner, who's the president of, of our company, will come and say, I want you to make a beer this year. I want it to be less cinnamon, clove, phenolic, and more banana, bubblegum flavor. Can, can you do that? And then I might call uh, Matthias or I, I might call... Um, uh, um, uh, Josef Engelmann, who's an expert on vice beer in Germany, and I'll say, what do you recommend for a yeast? And they might send me three or four strains, and we'll try them and see what works for us. 
Uh, and they'll usually have notes about this yeast it will attenuate so far. This yeast will produce this type of characteristic. This has to, it has to ferment at this temperature. So um, they will help us as we sort of design a beer. So when we design a beer, it's malt hops, uh, uh, water chemistry, but also the yeast that we use. And this allows us to have a very, very diverse range of beers and avoid uh, a house flavor. A brewery that only uses one yeast strain may be really adept at every idiosyncrasy of that yeast. Almost oh, it sounds like you two are teaming up to put the craft back in yeast. Yeah, hopefully. I also have to mention, right. it's not only me here in Weinstefan, we have a great team. It's uh, Professor Nazis, Professor Bob Egelman. We have a lot of technologists. I'm the yeast guy for sure in microbiology, but we have a lot of technologists and it only works in teamwork. And uh, Dan Offen is here uh, in, in Germany, also in the Hallertau doing hop selection or, or visiting other breweries or discussing with uh, Professor Nazis some technologies um, uh, it very much in detail. And that's, um, I also have to thank you, Dan, because it's not every brewer so interested in detail. Also, you can make a philosophy out of every beer type. Huh? Thank you. Well, you guys have both been very generous with your time, and I don't want to uh, over keep you too long. Uh, this was fantastic and, and really went in directions I never expected. I thought we'd spend more time talking mm -hmm. about Georgia, uh, but that's okay. I, I, the perspective was fantastic, and I, and I love it. 